Do you yearn for travel that involves outdoor adventure and learning? I do. I also have a passion for all things farming and agriculture. I've traveled to exotic jungles to learn about growing chocolate. I even once owned my own organic vegetable and sunflower farm. And now I'm planning my journey back to agriculture. Agritourism, defined as travel that involves some type of agricultural experience. Agritourism is all about entertaining. But the marketing strategist in me knows that, at its core, agritourism is really about educating, and education affects change. My Future Farm needs to deliver a profound experience to all of its visitors. It needs to educate people about food, health, and climate. Join me to learn from experienced agritourism farmers and entrepreneurs and help me build my future farm strategy. And who knows, maybe one day soon you'll find yourself in a tropical jungle cutting open cacao pods with a machete or savoring an outdoor plant-to-plate community dinner with 100 guests at a farm in Illinois. So let's tap into the agritourist in you. This is Jen Ross, your agritourist podcast host. Today, I'm not doing the interviewing. I am actually being interviewed by a longtime friend and coworker, Marissa Paisa. She is someone I totally trust and I am truly inspired by, and she knows me in all of my many life roles. I wanted to do this interview earlier in my journey so I could convey what I am thinking and feeling right now, and I plan on doing this again with Marissa later on in my journey. This process of being interviewed by someone and listening to it back is pretty intense, and it creates a sense of vulnerability, and it's definitely holding me accountable. So here goes. We hope you enjoy our conversation. So I'm here today with Jen Ross, who I have known before I knew myself. Um, To a little bit of a background, Jen and my sister were best friends since they were 12 years old, um, and I am 14 years younger than them, so I didn't even exist. And um, Jen has literally been a part of my life from the very start, and um, we do a lot of community work together. And one of the most fascinating things I find about Jen is she literally has done it all and done it well, and you don't see that in too many people. They either have a certain skill set, like myself. I have strengths, but then I have a plenty of weaknesses. Jen really has tackled everything successfully, which takes a lot of bravery and a lot of skill Um, from working in corporate America to being a community leader to working in agriculture and with our planet, which, of course, we will come to later on today. So that's just kind of setting a little bit of background of how we know each other and kind of where we're going with this, because um, we've kind of been on a lifelong journey together in our paths as well. And I always find it very inspiring how people can learn how you truly have done it all because many people haven't dabbled in so many things well. And I think that's such a strong strength. And I think people can learn from that um, as you're now in um, a new phase and where you're going in your journey. So I want to start a little bit with um, talk about where you grew up and where it all started for you. Well, thank you, Marissa. You're welcome. <laughs> and I have to say that one of my best memories of of you is taking you trick-or-treating with my best friend, Peggy, <laughs> when you were three years old. So that's how— And I, I was Big Bird. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I have that picture still. Um, so I grew up in Hotesville, Long Island, New York. Um, spent my whole life there pretty much. Uh, grew up, basically spent my whole life on Long Island. Um, and um, have a sister and two parents and an amazing upbringing. Um, and I graduated uh, high school and graduated Binghamton University with an accounting degree. Don't know how I did that, but <laughs> I did that. <laughs> Um, sat for the CPA exam and was the first person to walk out and realized I am not going to be an accountant. <laughs> I started my career at J.P. Morgan Chase. It was Chase Manhattan Bank at the time and quickly went from being an auditor and went into marketing and absolutely loved it. Loved every aspect of marketing. Spent about 14 years at Chase and then when after 20 mergers, (laughs) finally decided that that was it and um, didn't want to move, didn't want to go back to Manhattan and um, also had my second child at the time. I have three total. And 
I ended up leaving Chase and going out on my own. I started my own marketing consulting firm and have had it ever since. I think it's literally, I think it's 18 years old now, you know, but it's, it always was small. Um, I took on clients that I, you know, really enjoyed, really learned from, taught me a lot. I, I loved working with people with big missions and trying to help them grow that mission. I always felt that I became part of what they were doing. You know, I put, you know, my heart and soul into what they were trying to create. Um, Along the way, I raised three kids and I also got involved in a farm that donated all their food to food pantries. And that, that, Peace. I always was into health and wellness throughout right. my life. But when I started getting involved in the farm, something connected for me. It was just, you know, putting your hands in the dirt and and just growing these plants out of, you know, this little seed. It just watching life grow and that connection that that farm made for me to the earth and to health and to wellness and to life. I don't know. There was just something that connected for me when I was at that farm. And I, I've never been able to, you know, that that's always stayed with me. And I ended up volunteering um, at the farm for many years and then ended up leasing land at the back of the farm. And we called it Heartbeat Farms. I had started a program called Heartbeat uh, cafe, which was teaching kids in schools how to make healthier choices. And that program, I, I love that name because it was right. based on these two characters, Heart and Beat, that my friend Tim actually drew on a napkin one day. <laughs> and we actually created um, these these cartoons out of it and to teach kids how to make healthier choices. And so we took that name and then we that was the name of the farm. So we kind of – those characters manifested into the right. farm. And so we leased a few um, a few acres at this um, local farm in Center Reach, and we created Heartbeat Farms. And we had a CSA, and we had a mobile farm stand truck that was completely branded with Heartbeat where we'd pull up and the side would go up and we you know could sell vegetables – and it was an amazing experience and we it was the farm was doing extremely well and and then i had to give up the lease for a bunch of reasons and it was very sad but it was the right you know move and donated all the equipment to the farm that was there and they continue to do um farming there and donating vegetables to food pantries and you know i totally support their mission but i kind of left that world and continue with my marketing and raising my kids. Right. And now I'm here. <laughs> so how do you go from you had a very corporate career to the farming aspect to also talk about your community work because that strongly ties into the farming. I feel like almost your community leadership engagement brought you, you know, made the farming more natural for you because you were so used to giving back and being a part of something. And I feel like the skills you have from community leadership were why because somebody like me for example I love farming but I'm terrible like it's not my skill set I just enjoy it but you were able to actually understand it and pick it up in a way that the average person doesn't do you think that was as a result of your community work your business acumen or kind of a combination great question um, <laughs> I I wouldn't call myself the best farmer <laughs> I always I'm really good at listening and learning and I am good at marketing. Right. So I think whatever business you do, there's, you know, you take what skills you're best at and you either have people helping you with the other things or you learn only so much. Um, so when I was at my farm, um, and the other farmer, she, you know, she drove the farming aspect, the the real farm. I learned a tremendous amount I learned enough to know exactly what I was doing. I did a lot of research. I did a lot of connecting with people um, to learn and to bring the right people into teaching us what to do, what not to do, how to fix a problem. So 
I think it's not always just being I don't call myself I wouldn't call myself an expert farmer, but I definitely knew enough and knew how to engage the right people to figure out what to do. And again, I knew the business side. Right. So I was I was I was I'm always you know, whenever I get involved in community things, I'm always the one to kind of take on that business side. I really enjoy that. Um, but I really do love the business of agriculture and what agriculture does for this earth, what it does for our health, what it does for building community. There's just something about that piece. Um, and that's what keeps pulling me to it. Um as far as involvement in the community, yeah, I've always, again, it comes back to those things. All the things I'm involved in are about building community and building connection, and 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 it's attracted me to people, like-minded people that care about those things. And a lot of the things that are, you know, we're in, both of us are involved in our local historical society. Both of us. Went to a visioning meeting how many years ago? 2009, 2008. 2009. <laughs> we went to, I, I don't know, I one of us invited one of us to it. We both went and we listened to the vision of what our community could be. And both of us got so excited. We yeah. were like, wow. And one of the things that both of us, I used to drive past this boarded up schoolhouse. I, I guess I thought it was a schoolhouse. And I would always, as a kid driving past it, I'd be like, what is in that? What is that thing? Right. Everyone. The school bus would go past it, I feel like, when we were younger kids. And we're like, what is this old building? Yes. And then when we were sitting in that meeting, I remember both of us were like, okay, we need to figure out, like, that's a gem in our community. We need to figure out what it is, what the history is. How can we reopen it? How can we make it like a community gathering place, something, right. you know, when you have a gem in the community, capitalize on it. Don't just try to create other things. You know, I, I wanted to use what we had. And that was one of those historical pieces of our community that I knew could impact this community. So you and I set out to find who who the person is who runs that. <laughs> we found her and now we're like best friends. With we, her. we stalked her through <laughs> different means and called her out of nowhere. But yes, BJ and Tini, you know who you are. And and we love her. She's fantastic. She's a force. <laughs> she is. She's absolutely wonderful. <laughs> and hysterical. <laughs> BJ has some of the best one-liners of everybody I've ever met in my life. And she doesn't even intend to. She'll just – we'll be at a like, you know, board meeting talking about things. And she has these phenomenal one-liners that I don't even know where they come from. And they're witty and they're just what we needed. Exactly. We love BJ. <laughs> and I think she loves us. So we found her and she had a board of – 80 and 90 year old people who yeah. did a lot in this community, but she was the only one really holding up that board. So she welcomed us, our energy at the time. And we opened up that schoolhouse. It's an 1850 schoolhouse on its original foundation. And we now, you know, we were able to get it, it renovated and to bring in everything it needed. And we do programs with the local elementary schools and host events and host speakers and do all sorts of events on the property. And the one interesting thing about, you know, it's basically four of us on the board. Right. And it, you know, we do everything. We do. And <laughs> it's all volunteer. But we have fun. And then on top of it, I didn't even realize at the time it's attached to this 102-acre park that literally is in my backyard that had these trails and we ended up working with the community to clean it out because there was there were a lot of old cars in there and um, it was a dumping ground for it, unfortunately it, a yes. long time and it took us a bunch of years but we now it is actively used there are marked hiking trails that we helped mark. I'm going to give credit where it's due. You worked with Suffolk County single-handedly to mark out those trails. Credit where it's due. You did. And they're fantastic and used all the time. And people bring their dogs in there now. And it is actively used. And it is it is such a gem in our community. And it's literally we are the custodians of that property. So it's so interesting how this one little house that was boarded up and us being at this visioning meeting ended up being like 
now this center of the community, both from an environmental perspective, we do environmental hikes there from, you know, a health perspective, people are hiking and we do a run in there and people jog in there. The community is actively using it. And all the history that we've brought back to the community through our events. And, you know, we're constantly being asked questions about, you know, my my grandfather lived here. Do you have, you know, do you have history about this? And it's been such an amazing project that evolved from this. So I don't want to say it, it's a lot of work, but it it's not. It's true. Because it naturally evolved. And it also naturally evolved into the things that we love. Yes. And I think it's an interesting point you make there because I feel like the lay person, so it was just recently Earth Day to tie that together. And I feel like the lay person, let's be honest, everyone's busy doing a million things. You don't appreciate the planet. You don't even think about it half the time, sadly, um, because people get so wrapped up in their own worlds. But without that, planet Earth is one thing we all have in common, despite the world of uh, differences these days. And without planet Earth, we're not here. So I think it's been a really interesting way that something that maybe was, you know, your passion, our passion as a board has now become it's helped get the community involved in nature, in the environment, in agriculture. And maybe they weren't looking for it. Maybe they felt they were too busy for it. It wasn't their thing. But seeing the turnout at, you know, the programs that you ran um, through Heartbeat, the programs that run in the park, obviously there is the interest. So when people take the time to stop and think and breathe for a minute, um, on top of it being the one thing that connects us and that's vital to us existing, obviously people do care about it because the turnouts speak for themselves. So it's an interesting way to look at it, how What's been your focus of you, you know, being passionate about walking about that park because it literally is in your backyard and having those trails exist. So many other people are now benefiting from that. So obviously and and your, you know, your your family, your kids have been a huge part of it since they were little. Um, They're a part of all of our events. They've been a part of the farming um, and they've become, you know, now adults who care because of they were exposed to it, which is great. And in turn, they've also been involved with projects they've started with their friends, like donations and things like that, because they learned about it from a young age. So I know it's a loaded question. Obviously, personally, I tell you this. I I'm, I tell you, you're not allowed to ever leave Farmingville because you've been way too big of an impact. I don't care what <laughs> you say. I won't let you in some way even. But that being said, There are so many things that have grown from your passion. I know you can't pinpoint one thing, but what might be your immediate next step on this journey that not only are you on, but you've brought so many other programs have been created as a result of it? What might be the next step in this moment? (laughs) In this moment. (laughs) Because, I mean, life is a journey and there will be many more. So not to say, like, tell me everything on the next steps, but your, your immediate next step. Well, what... So, okay, let's back up here. So I've been doing my marketing, and I've noticed that I keep having this pull back to agriculture. And it's, you know, my my youngest, Abby, is graduating in 2025. Which is crazy. Remember when she was born? Yes. So we're in the midst of basketball. She wants to play basketball in college. So we're in the midst of recruiting and traveling and trying to get her recognized and figuring out a good academic and basketball school, which is exciting. Right. But it also presents an opportunity for me to say, okay, now's the time to really focus on or to refocus my energy on making that transition back to agriculture in a way I in 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 some way. The, right. That way is what I'm trying to figure out. So I've, I've, I don't want to say cleaned house, but I've had a lot of marketing clients, but I've really been trying to focus my energy on clients that really align with my values and what I'm really excited about doing. Because I do become part of their business. Absolutely. That's the way, that's the only way I know how to work with people is to really get engaged And become part of their business, not just work for them, not just to do a social media post for them. I need to be in their business. I need to really be part of it. 
and in order to help them. So I've kind of lowered the number of clients I'm working with, and I've refocused my energy on doing some things to figure out my next steps. And one of those was to create this podcast. And I listen to podcasts. I love listening to podcasts on every topic imaginable. I There are certain people that just are so inspiring, and whatever topic they bring to the table, I'm interested in hearing. And I've learned so much. And I feel it also keeps me connected. I do it on my walks. I've been, I do morning walks every day. Doesn't matter the weather. I do them, and they're not just a physical health thing. They're a mental and emotional health thing. Absolutely. I always tell people that it's it's mind, body, and soul. It's not just about physical health. And on my morning walks, I listen to my podcasts, and I've always wanted to dabble in podcasting. But there is that fear, like, what do I have to say? You know, is it important? You know? Absolutely. So I put a lot of thought into what do I want to learn? And, you know, so during always when I'm making a transition, I do a lot of education and interviewing. And I, I, I start meeting with people and talking to people about whatever it is I want to get into. So instead of just interviewing people on my own, I figured, let me let me make a podcast out of it. So I'm getting educated. I'm interested. And whoever out there may be interested, it will help them as well. So my topic, you know, it's called The Agritourist, My Journey Back to Agriculture. And I am interviewing people who are doing, who are in agriculture in some way. So it's not just a traditional farm all the time. Sometimes it's a chocolate business that is um, doing trips, you know, immersive trips to Ecuador or, um, you know, Costa Rica. Which I love, not to interrupt you, but I learned from you how chocolate can be healthy. I had no idea. And you opened my eyes to that. So it's really amazing what is out there that people do not realize. I took a trip to Belize uh, many years ago to learn about chocolate because, again, most people do not know that chocolate is not just this I had no bar yep. <laughs> that, you know, is made in a factory. It actually comes from a plant or a tree, really, the cacao tree. And there's a whole process on how it's made. And it's there's a whole economy behind chocolate. Um, so, Again, the agriculture interested me, you know, how things are grown. Right. So it's always been this this interest of mine, whether it was chocolate or kale. You right, know, it right. didn't matter. So, so this podcast basically is a way for me to learn from people who are doing all sorts of agritourism that they've integrated into their farms. So I'm interviewing people who have written books um, – uh, you know, uh, this woman owns a vineyard and um, uh, a farmer up in Vermont who ha- who is a dairy farm. Uh, I'm farm sanctuaries who have Airbnbs. And there's just, you know, there's so many different things that people are doing. And I've done about seven or eight interviews so far, and I have many planned. And I am just so inspired by what I'm learning, and it's giving me all sorts of ideas about what do I want to do? How do I want to incorporate some of the things that I'm learning? Also, how, you know, one a main message that I keep hearing from a lot of these people is, you know, slow and easy, you know, yeah. don't, you know, ha- you know, how to go about doing it, because it's not easy financially these days to take on something um, and a a business in general. So, so there's just so much that I'm learning that I'm so excited about, you know, going forward with. Um, So the podcast is, is basically just a way for me to learn and for others to learn. And I'm just, I, I get so energized from every conversation I have and just that energy makes me feel that 
I'm doing the right thing. That's like, how you know. I'm I'm connecting. I'm make you know, I'm in the flow that I, you know, I'm in the place I need to be. I'm meeting the people I need to meet on my journey. And it's just amazing. I feel reconnected again. I felt like I was so disconnected. And I'm just by these, just by talking to these people, I'm so reconnected again. Which is so important. Now talk about how your agricultural journey has also tied into the food that you yourself are growing on this journey and how it's impacted your life, how other people can, I mean, I can say, not to jump ahead, but some of the this, this soups that you've made from things you've grown has changed my diets, and I have gotten healthier by extension of things I've learned from you. So talk about how food itself plays a role in that journey. So there are four things that are super important to me, and food is one of them, and we'll talk about that. But it's health, you know, health. And when I say the word health, I mean every part of your health. It's the earth and environment. Um, it's building community, connection. So going back to the food, I was never, uh, you know, I always loved eating vegetables. <laughs> uh, and as I started growing them, my connection to vegetables grew and grew. And, you know, you learn creative ways to make them. And I was the person, and so were my kids, who would pick a piece of kale or pick a carrot without washing it and just eat it right from harvesting it. And um, Abby loves to eat kale off the farm, which is crazy. <laughs> but <laughs> um, but it, that connection to plants grew. And, you know, I did I, I, at the at Heartbeat Farms, we had a, a plant-based soup company. So basically we took one ingredient, we'll take, let's say, kale or whatever, and we had a chef that would help us convert that into a soup. And it was um, a vegetable broth. I didn't want to use chicken broth. I know that sometimes improves the taste, but I wanted it to be totally vegetable-based. And so that whole plant-based theme definitely evolved from there. And then during... Actually, during COVID, I did make the transition and I said, let's go, you know, let's go vegan. And it was more for health reasons at first. Like, I I never had health problems, but I started feeling like I was having some digestive issues as you age. Things happen oh, yeah. in your body and especially as a woman. And I was just like, you know what? I You try everything else. These All these diets, gluten-free, this, oh, that. Yeah. I, you know, I just was like, like you know what? Let me try this. It was intimidating, though, because I'm like, how am I going to come up with all these recipes? How am I going to come up with – it wasn't about not including meat. It was just about how do I keep vegetables creative and yes. diverse and have enough recipes where I feel like – you know, and not complicated. I was like, what am I going to have to do to make Absolutely. this – do I need 15 hours a day yes. to prep things? That's right. what was concerning me. Sometimes you look at these recipes, and I'm not good with recipes. I just need, like, quick and easy things. I just don't have a lot of time in the kitchen, and I'm actually just I'm just not one of those people. So I tried it, and I haven't gone back. I don't I, – I honestly feel, and I'm not just saying this, I was healthy at the time, but my health and my digestion and – my just my energy is phenomenal now it, it i i feel so much better than i did i haven't had any digestive issues i i just feel so good inside and out and you know it, being plant based has just given me so many health benefits that i you know, when I, if there are some times where I don't know that there is dairy in something or don't know there is meat in something, I will know. Yeah. I know right away. My body reacts to it. And I don't enjoy it. Like, I, I actually don't enjoy it because I know how bad it makes me feel. So I can't, I, I don't want it. Right. And I don't crave it anymore. Your body does, a lot of people are like, oh, how, I'm not going to enjoy looking forward to you know, 
tofu and vegetables or whatever. But I actually crave those things. Oh, I love tofu. I enjoy those things. Right. And I think your body, when you make transitions like this, your body changes. It and does. you do start craving those things. And you start... And when you do eat those other things, your body actually reacts negatively to it. Now, once you go plant-based and you do, you know, you enjoy it and you stick to it and you see those benefits, being plant-based has such an impact on the earth, the environment, and, you know, animals. Yeah. And the animals also, you know, affect the earth and the environment, you know, so that whole process, that whole operation that's been created around, you know, uh, you know, raising these animals for meat has, you know, hurt the earth in so many different ways. And I'm not going to get into all that. There are plenty of people who can, who, who know a lot about that. But the benefit of going plant-based has basically aligned with everything I believe right. and everything I do. You know, I want to create an environment for myself, for my family, for my kids, for my friends that is healthy, both in what we eat, how we live, where we live, you know, who we connect with. It just, it all connects. And agriculture for me is at the center of that because you know, how we treat the earth, like by me farming, by people gardening, by everyone getting involved in this, even if it's in a small capacity, even if it's in a, you know, like two by two right. space in it's your backyard, start. it's a start and it's helping the earth. It's helping the soil. And then the vegetables you are growing are helping your body. So it's just it's full circle. It is. And then, you know, if you're gardening and you go online or you talk to people, you're building connections about how to do things and how to, you know, how to grow that tomato better or, you know, it, it builds community. Absolutely. So the, it, it's just such, for me, it's such a force and I just can't seem to get away from it even if I want to try. That's, but that's telling you something right there. Now, speaking of that... Um, I guess the duality at play is community work. You are such a force there. And that is very focused in particularly in our area of Farmingville, New York. Now, agriculture can be anywhere. How do you balance that? I know that you're on a journey, so you don't know where the future will take you. But how do you balance because you are such a fixture in the community leadership work here, which also ties into that work as well and the park? But as you mentioned, you know, your youngest is going to be getting ready to go to school somewhere. So you don't really know where that takes you. So that's kind of a million dollar question that you might not have the answer for. But what do you, what might you think in this moment on how you might balance that going forward, depending on what happens? So I have done a lot of networking and reaching out locally. You know, we live on Long Island. We live close to Stony Brook University, for those who may not be familiar with the area, center of Long Island, east, west, north, south. I mean, hey, we we travel 20 minutes north or south, and we're by water. It's amazing here. It is. I, I love Long Island. But there are challenges to finding land here and finding people who believe that that's important. That's the challenge I found. Now, out east on Long Island, we have a lot of farmland. And there are there are several initiatives around preserving that farmland because unfortunately, as people move out from the city, we need more housing, right? We need more senior housing. Uh, commercial properties are going up everywhere, franchises. And the focus is more about selling property for those types of profits and for building and preserving land is just not the priority. And I have, after I had to give up my lease at the other farm, I actively looked for farmland or for a piece of property. I was looking for residential property locally where someone, you know, was living in Pennsylvania and they still had property here and right. they weren't building on it, but they were holding on to the land. Even if it was just for a few years, I I, I actually would 
track them down and get in touch and say, look, I'll pay your taxes. Let me use the property for a few years. I'll just hook up the water and I'll farm on it. And right. I thought I could create, you know, because you're, we're allowed to do that here in Brookhaven Township. And the answer was always no. And I was so saddened by that. I mean, I was trying everything. I worked with some of the politicians locally and said, do you have land anywhere? And I just never was met with the support or the excitement that this or the recognition of how important this is. Because if we keep building on our soil, Mm -hmm. we're hurting this earth. And so it's been years of trying. And I and then obviously the property values here are just ridiculously high. So getting land here and doing what I'd like to do is probably not it it, it it's not gonna fit the right. vision. It's just not gonna align. I have family here and friends here. So I know that my connection to Long Island is never going to be gone. And it might mean going back and forth, right. you know. I don't see me not being part of our historical society and you're not allowed to leave so <laughs> <laughs> but i do you know i i so those connections i still think will be retained however i am looking mostly in the northeast okay maybe pennsylvania i i've been specifically looking in connecticut because it's close to Long Island, right. and I can easily commute. The ferry is amazing. You know, it's Absolutely. an hour and a half ride, and you know, you don't have to worry about going around the the city, but you still at least have that option. There's a lot of options. Yeah, less bridges. So I'm trying to find a piece of property that I can create some type of agricultural education center. Where I will have, I don't need acres and acres of farmland. I don't have the capacity to do that. But I would love a very large market garden somewhere where I can work with college interns, which we used to do at our farm. We had a great program with Stony Brook University. And I loved working with students who had these big ideas. We used to, they used to want to test things out and we created projects for them. And some of them have gone on to their master's in agriculture. And it's so exciting to still be connected to them and hear what they're doing. And hopefully maybe one day (laughs) I can work with them again. Yeah, absolutely. But I want a place where I can grow, you know, and I have a few, you know, it it doesn't even like you can grow a lot on a quarter of an acre. It does not have to be acres and acres of, of land. However, I would like land so that I can go hiking and I can, you know, do things on that property and invite people. I would love people to be able to come. I'd love an Airbnb or some type of cottage situation where people can come and stay and learn and get educated. An opportunity to really connect them to what, what, why, and and the what, the why, the how. Right. So that they could take that back and recreate that in some way in their community. I want to do plant-based dinners where we can bring people in and bring a chef in and have them create create amazing meals with plants that That'd we're be, growing. That would be really cool. And not just to eat plant-based, but to also to have meaningful conversations. Yes. Yeah. To invite people, different people in and, and have dinners with people that you don't know and people you do know. And just have invigorating conversation. That's the whole community connection piece that we're missing. We're missing these days. So there are tons of agritourism components that I want to incorporate and that I'm learning from all these amazing people that I'm interviewing. And so I'm in the process of just filtering all this and thinking it through. I am looking at properties. Uh... There is a particular property I'm looking at in Connecticut. It's in northwestern Connecticut. And I'm actually going to – they are selling in the fall and moving out west. Great couple. It's a two-acre total property. It's it's a great property. It has a house. It has a little store on the property. They grow on on about a quarter to a half an acre of their property. But they they have a tremendous business on the property already for many years. And – they really want to sell to someone who is going to farm because they've built a great 
the, what they built is amazing. I think, unfortunately, they're getting a lot of buyers who want to just develop develop the property, which is the last like thing. Build we need a there. bigger house, or right. or take down the farm that they they built. Worked so hard to build, right? And so, I'm actually going to be volunteering there once a week, starting in May. Just to get to know, because it's there's so much to know about zoning and yes. what I can and cannot do, because some of the things I just talked about, I may not be able to do on this property. Right. So you have to learn the zoning. There's so many components. You know, I have to understand their tax structure. I have to know the area. Right. Do I like this area? That's true. Um, so, so by volunteering and helping them out and getting to know the area and asking a lot of questions and seeing also the customers that come in. That's you know, true. Connecting with some of the people that... Are, are in that area, I think it'll give me a good sense of, do I like this? Yeah, could this you know? be? Absolutely. And then there's the whole question about how to execute, how to do this, you know, how to fund this, how, you know, there's a lot of question marks. Right. But that's all part of my research. That's what I do. You know, there's a lot of opportunity. There are a lot of agricultural loans out there. There are a lot of companies that that um, give loans to organic farms. There there are a lot of opportunities. It's just a matter of really mining all that and right. really understanding it. So that's part of my mission right now is to really do that research and start making that transition as my kids, you know, evolve into their lives and careers and hopefully start moving out of the house. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. You never know what happens these days. <laughs> the 23-year-old's still there, and one's in college, and she's studying in economics and sustainability. Which is great. Going to Mexico this summer to work with some coffee and chocolate farmers. How cool is that? Tying it in right there, there see? I'm there jealous. You go. <laughs> <laughs> I told her I'm interviewing you when you get back. You have to. Yes. So I'm very excited for her. And and. I'm excited to see what where this takes her, like what she does. From Could be on a journey guess, together. Who knows? You never know. You don't know. So regarding the podcast, which is just getting ready to um, be your next phase immediately, how can people find you when that kicks off? How's that going to be um, able to be searched? So I'm using my old website, Heartbeat Farms, H-E-A-R-T-B-E-E-T, farms.com as the the home base. So we had so many amazing pictures and history from that farm and and that that farm started this all and those characters and I still do I still do classes gardening classes in some schools. It's still alive. Right. And so I I don't want it to die. So uh through heartbeat farms Dot com and agritourist agra a g r i dash tourist dot com you will be able to link up to the podcast it will be available on all the platforms as it launches out so i'll have more details but if you go to heartbeatfarms.com dot com there are, there is a page i'm also everybody i interview if they have a farm or some type of tourist destination, they will be on there. So if someone's interested in doing some type of like adventure travel or something to do with animals or agriculture or farming, I'm going to be listing and linking you to all the amazing places that I'm learning about, which includes the Mocha Origin Adventures and chocolate coffee trips. It includes some of the farms farm stays that, you know, the woman in Vermont uh, and and some of the uh, Airbnbs that are located on some of these amazing farm sanctuaries in Florida and one up in uh, Massachusetts. So there's some amazing places. And I highly encourage people to connect with some of these people because it will change your life. Absolutely. And it has already changed yours, and clearly it's impacted, you know, your daughter and all your kids and and people around you. I mean, um, you know, we have a youth civic, and directly because of the work we worked with with you, the kids had an interest in gardening, so we had volunteered with you at that farm. And the kids took on a project, and now it was all their own idea. They now run um, two 25-foot plots that they pick what they're growing they take some to their families and they put together recipes and the rest they donate to five shelters every week. So that 
what you've done has impacted other people and opened their eyes to it. And like you said, there's it's such a big world out there. And while you're on your own journey, you're taking people along with you. And they might not even know they need to be on a journey, but I think they figure it out as they go along. Um, so my my last question for you, because I know we've covered a lot of great ground, um, is besides the podcast aspect, if somebody wants to get in touch with you because you have had such an exciting journey thus far in your life and you have so much more to go, how do they get in touch with you directly if they want to talk to you? Because they might hear something on this and think, hey, that triggered something. I want to pick your brain about that um, while I watch your journey. Would it be through the websites or would there be a different way for them to contact you? Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> email, phone, text. You know, through the way my my information is on heartbeatfarms.com. You can contact me directly through there. So absolutely. Um, you know, I I that's the one thing I welcome talking to people because I just believe that every connection happens for a reason, whether you're helping someone or they're helping you. Definitely. And, you know, I'm here to serve in that way. And you certainly have been so far. And that's why I say I love watching your journey because I've been a part of it myself, and there are things I've learned about that I wasn't expecting to, like I said, changing my eating and activity habits, observing the use of you know our park and our programs because of things you've implemented while you're on your own journey. And I think in life, people forget that you know it's not just about your journey, it's watching others' journeys because your journey might go in a different direction. So I think while you're on your path of the next steps that you uncover, while you take people along with you, they might unexpectedly um, be on a new journey themselves. So I first and foremost thank you for taking me on this journey because uh, I have certainly gone down different paths because of the things you've exposed me to. And I'm excited for your journey because, you know, the, the only rule I have for you is you can't fully leave Farmingville, but you know that. <laughs> so while your journey takes you in whatever directions, you'll, you'll, you know, you'll have roots in several places. And I'm excited to see where it goes. Thank you. And I just want to thank you. I wanted to I wanted to talk about this journey um, outside of the typical podcast <laughs> platform and I was really thinking about who I could do that with and Marissa you are such an inspirational person you do so much for our community in so many different ways. Um, you've p pulled me along many times, <laughs> kicking and screaming, um, you know, but I, you've done so much for me and inspired me so much. Um, you're very persistent in, and you keep trying even in the face of, of people <laughs> always <laughs> who are challenging, but I, you know, but you are so mission focused and articulate and smart. And I was like, you are the perfect person to interview me. And I thank you for taking the time because I know there's a lot of things going on right now in your life. So thank you for taking the time to do this. I truly appreciate it. I've really enjoyed it. And I always learn from you. I've been learning from you my whole life. And I look forward to uh, learning for you from you on the next steps of the journey. Thank you. Thank you. I hope our Agritourist podcast prompts you to think more about where your food comes from, whether it be your vegetables, fruits, meats, and even those sweet treats. Don't forget to subscribe and share this podcast with someone you think may truly benefit from or be inspired by it. Visit us at agra-tourist.com. Until next time. As we are learning from many of our farmers and entrepreneurs, strong connections help propel our visions. Through my interview with Lisa Chase from the University of Vermont Extension and Vermont Tourism Research Center, I was connected to an exciting and new organization called the Global Agritourism Network, or GAN for short. The Global Network is made up of agritourism stakeholders from around the world. They include farmers and ranchers, researchers, educators, community planners, policymakers, agricultural service providers, and tour operators, among others. It is currently free to join, so if you have any interest in agritourism, 
Check them out at agritourism.eurac.edu slash G-A-N or just Google Global Agritourism Network. The link will be in our show notes as well. You never know, this global network may help you take your agritourism vision to the next level.